Hello, my name is Rob Simpson and welcome to Directors Uncut. If this is your first episode, welcome. We put filmmakers from all corners of the globe onto a huge list that covers everything from inventive indie names climbing through the ranks to the offspring of cinema titans. Then, we turn it into a lottery of directors and by using a random number generator, we pick a name out of the hat. Whatever name comes out, myself and guest hosts discuss them and their work through two films. This one is from the Patreon archive and the next new recording is the 21st so that'll come up the the Friday following but other than that it's all back to back Patreon migrations I guess you'd call them but once all that is cleared it'll be it'll be smooth sailing and it'll just be pure new episodes And I can hardly wait. And when that happens, the show will go back to being a fortnightly affair rather than this this, uh, weekly run that we've been having. Because honestly, if this run was fortnightly, I think we'd have been doing it most of the rest of the year. Which isn't ideal, honestly. So just just get it out of the way. Just clear the backlog. Um, So yeah, without any further ado, let's jump into the previous recording. And I'll do it in a seamless fashion this time. Um, this week I am joined by Andrew from the Behold podcast and Graham from Pop Screen. Hello there. Also, hello there. <laughs> I, I I went last. I had time to think of something fancy and I didn't. It's it, it's okay. Podcasting isn't for everyone. I, I realised I said I put you on the spot there by saying your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the last thing I expected on this podcast was to be introduced. <laughs> it's just part of how we're shaking up the format. Hmm. So how have you both been uh, since the last episode? Or two episodes since Andrew was asked on. Indeed, yeah. Um, well, I, I've been embracing our new unwisely granted post-lockdown freedoms. I am currently in Cambridge visiting friends. The weather is lovely. Thank you for asking. But well, you didn't really give us a chance, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Just speeding things up, really. Yes, the, the weather is lovely, <laughs> by which I mean my room is currently, I'd say, roughly 500 million degrees. That's how I like it. I can't really follow that, can I, to be honest? I can't segue out of that, like, a neatly, a neatly sachet segue. I kind of just got to blunder my way through this. Yeah, that's true. If we if we were doing the day the Earth caught fire, that would be one thing. But no, it's just the day the Earth stood still. Which you could you sort of draw some lines between that and what's happening in the world. I don't know, but yeah. a bit tortured. Yeah, honestly. But boy, today sure is so hot that I want to just get under some shade and stay still. <laughs> there we go. Seamless. Absolute hospital radio standard. So, I've never listened to hospital radio. I don't feel like I'm missing anything, to be honest, but there we go. <laughs> I was once on hospital radio, and I don't think I've significantly improved since then. Community radio is much the same, hmm. to be honest. It's just who listens to it. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so awkward, awkward segue. We did have that. a segue and then we wandered <laughs> off from it. It's bizarre. I, I, I take time out my day, give you these precious gifts, and you just throw them back in my face. It's like we're self-sabotaging here. Hmm. Anywho, Robert <laughs> Wise, latest director, bit of a journeyman director, so this is possibly the director that we're most likely to have had any exposure to beforehand. Yeah, this was fun. We threatened Rob with watching musicals. Yeah. I mean, if you want a podcast with me being horrible about musicals, that's that's the episode I get. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's as valid as any reaction, I guess. Um, But yeah, in in terms of my previous exposure to Robert Wise, I had seen West Side Story. I had seen The Day the Earth Stood Still um, and... Curse of the Cat People, his first film, uh, which it is I don't think is entirely successful, but it's definitely a really bold effort to go your own way with the sequel. So he does, as Rob implied, have the sort of career where he's done so much and covered so many genres, it seems unlikely that you won't have seen at least one thing. Oh, I also saw The Haunting. I wrote a review of The Haunting for The Geek Show a few years back as well. 
Andrew, exposure, yeah. any? I mean, I, I feel like everyone on the planet has seen at least 20 minutes of The Sound of Music, haven't they? <laughs> 20 minutes out of the, like, I don't know, five hours or whatever it is. <laughs> it's a very complex story about nuns and Nazis. It does make it sound a bit like a Valerian Boracic film when you put it that way, really, doesn't it? I mean, my only exposure to nuns and movies has been through the the sexploitation subgenre, so I'm exactly, not yeah. to answer this question. <laughs> Robert Wise's film about nuns was a bit different to the one that Paul Verhoeven's just put out. Yes, it is. But yeah, For me, anyway, Robert uh, Wise is, is very much one of those. You'll have seen at least one thing he's done. Yes. Without realising you've seen like something by him is just, yeah. Um, I've seen The Haunting. And The Haunting is one of the all-time great haunted house movies. Hmm. Um, the bit with the knocking at the door, I mean, to say it in isolation, it sounds like nothing, but when you're watching it... Yeah. It's no, incredible. it's fantastic. Yes, but we're not doing that. Two movies we're doing. Andrew said... That, I think Andrew said them earlier, but if he hasn't, I'm going to say them again. Uh, hmm. Day of the Day stood still and Odds Against Tomorrow. So which one do we want to tackle first? Because usually we'd break up to smaller, bigger... Weird, normal. Bit hard this week, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it just uh, everything is across the map, so there's no real obvious starting place for us. Should we start Should we start with the day the Earth stood still? Because it is the one that wasn't new to me, so it, it's got a little bit of familiarity on its side, I guess. The ship is now resting exactly where it landed two hours ago, and so far there is no sign of life from inside it. Troops have been rushed across the Potomac River from Fort Myer and have thrown a cordon around the ship. They are supported by tanks, artillery, and machine guns. Behind the police lines, there's a huge crowd of curiosity seekers. The Army has taken every precaution to meet any emergency which may develop. Every eye, every weapon is trained on the ship. It's been that way for two hours, and the tension is just beginning just a minute, ladies and gentlemen, I think something is happening. It's a very simple synopsis in a lot of ways, because uh, the it, it takes place when an actual verified alien spaceship lands in America. Uh, an alien called uh, Klaatu gets out. He is immediately shot by the American military because, you know, this was made in the 50s, but some things never change. Uh, well, in their defence, Graham, how were they supposed to know he came in peace when all he did was walk out of the spaceship and yell, I come in peace? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in alien language, that could mean anything. It could mean hope. Yeah. <laughs> so his big robot goon, Gort, uh, neutralises the army's weapons. Klaatu is taken to a hospital, which he escapes from, and goes on the run where he meets Roald Dahl's wife, if memory serves. Well, That's Patricia Needle, isn't it? She was married to Roald Dahl for ages. Yes, she was. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Yes. That's your uh, fact for the week. And and it all becomes a, a, a message movie about world peace with a big robot in it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing I've got to appreciate about this. This is comes within the canon of 1950s Space Invaders movies. Mm. And typically, all of these are like, look out for laws, com- I mean, aliens. <laughs> yes. They're totally not communists. Shh, not communists. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, hello, we and come from the planet Space Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> But this one, it doesn't even come close to that, though, which I genuinely appreciated. It stands out amongst that crowd of, I don't know how you describe them, sort of foreigner-fearing sci-fi movies from the sissies. Yeah, so, I've generally heard them referred to as 50s B-movies, which I think erases a lot of non-science fiction-based 50s B-movies. But it, it's one of those things where everyone basically knows what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Well, there's just so many of them. I mean, some of them are good. Uh, the original Body Snatchers is yeah. good and it does stand up, but for every one of that, there's a hundred, a thousand of the... It is literally communists. <laughs> yes. Which, is, in a strange way, isn't that far away from how people thought about aliens in general uh, at this point, that when you look at UFO reports from the 50s, 
the people who claimed alien contact generally said, oh, the aliens are a very advanced race, and they said we need to get rid of all of our nukes and we can come and live among the people of the galaxy. There is, in fact, a theory that one of the alien contactee movements in Spain, I think they were called the the Yomite movement never actually believed they contacted aliens and it was just a covert way to spread communist propaganda under the Franco regime. I uh, know, I've got to say this here because I don't know how many podcasts this is going to become relevant. There's been yeah. a new sort of like popping out every now and again how there is something in America that they're hiding, that it, there is some sort of extraterrestrial life out there that's mm. been hiding it, which... It's interesting. I know it's not really related to this movie, but it's just something I wanted to bring up. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of durable plot point, isn't it? Because you can make it as paranoid or as optimistic as you want. It is nice to think that there's alien life out there. It is terrifying to think that the government might be hiding it. True. It is petrifying to think that the current government might be in touch with aliens. Here. Well, you say in touch. I think... Did you say Men in Black... When the <laughs> when the like his costume was really really bad and he was obviously an alien. Yes. You, you see now a prime minister, right? I I see where you're going with this. Yeah, I think you've probably got a pretty good point there. <laughs> yeah, just the, underneath that mess of hair is like a little button that causes his entire head to kind of split apart, <laughs> and there's a tiny alien driving the Boris. <laughs> It's pretty believable, though. It's pretty believable. Right, yes. oh, like the, the whaws and whaws. And just like how it needs to release the build-up of gas that kind of clogs up the <laughs> mechanisms. Yeah, most of Boris Johnson's speeches are just engine noise. <laughs> okay, let's, let's try and... I, 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 I'm a blame for this detail. <laughs> I appreciate that. But, uh, yeah, Andrew, what did you think of The Daily F Stood Still? Yeah, the, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, this was kind of the main reason I wanted to come on the show is, is I mean, it's one of the sci-fi classics, isn't it? So mm. I did want to finally get around to watching it. And yeah, it's just, it's kind of hard to say things about it because I feel like it's one of those things where everything it's done has been so influential that it's just kind of like the bedrock of modern day science fiction. So mm. like, if I say something like, oh, it's so good that it's, you know, a science fiction film, that has a message about, you know, real world politics. That seems like just kind of a, well, yeah, no, duh, that's kind of the point of science fiction. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, it was once upon a time. Now it's just look at those explosions, egads. I mean, it still is in some quarters of Hollywood, but yes. Oh, no, I mean, that's what I mean. Like, that's modern science. There was that uh, piece, wasn't there, that um, I think it was a few years back that Simon Pegg did, where he said sci fi used to be thoughtful and about asking questions. Now it's mm. just big budgets and making explosions in space. Yes, very true. Yeah. I think th this is a, a pretty well upholstered movie by 50s science fiction standards, isn't it? I mean, if you want to go to the cheap end, there is some fabulously cheap 50s science fiction. You know, the whole Edward end of things. But this isn't that. I mean, yes. the costumes aren't good. Mm. Yeah, Gort is... They're somewhat unconvincing robots. Yes. <laughs> like the way his knees crease whenever he walks. I mean, it's not specifically said that he's metal. He could be a robot who just wears a full body suit because, I don't know, he's cold. Well, given the sort of 1960s ideal of space and science, like hmm. the universe and the cosmos is just magnificently camp. <laughs> yes. And I guess it, this is too a little bit. The costume that you see, uh, Klaatu, was it, mm. um, rock up in. I mean, that's bizarre. I mean, you, you could make a sort of case for it to be sort of a, a prototype of what would come later in further decades of sci-fi. Yeah. I know costume isn't the big thing, but uh, I'm going to segue out of that because I kind of want to bring this up too in the same mm. sort of uh, idea of it sort of forging the way for future stuff. Within the genre, anyway, it's um, Bernard Herrmann and his score. Oh man, it's it's a great score. I mean, it, again, as with Andrew, I am concerned that it's not a news flash to say that Bernard Herrmann he could write some film music, all right, but he really could, <laughs> and this is great. 
Yeah, it's an absolute cracking bit of theremin. Yes. It, it's kind of like um, Ennio Morricone in his uh, Spaghetti Western trilogy. He just, mm. you know, accidentally invented an entire genre of music. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Which is always uh, intriguing, I feel. It's one of those things, too, that was quite influential in the real world. Like, it would be one thing if Bernard Herrmann had just invented the sound of space travel on film. That would be impressive enough. But apparently Neil Armstrong was a massive fan of theremin music. True. I think one thing that this film does very well and that differentiates it from both television science fiction and, as I say, the really low-budget B-movies is that it has a sense of scale. You know, its its global scale is sketched in at the beginning and it is sketchy and it is mockable, but it, it does a pretty brisk job establishing that this is a massive worldwide news story. I mean, it is a problem that every single British person at the start appears to have been dubbed by Jonathan Ross, but I admire <laughs> the effort. Yeah, I mean, at least we get like, the BBC was there and Radio Calcutta, so, you know, mm. covering the two bases for the entire world uh, there nicely. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, as I don't know, I wasn't entirely won over by it, I'll be honest. I think... The thing with me, I've recently watched some other uh, B-movies that I liked less, and uh, I recognise this better, but I think maybe one thing that is just a problem for me is that very declamatory acting style that they insisted on. It's not my favourite thing. It's very 1950s, isn't it? Yeah, but the other film we're going to cover is 1950s, and I don't think this has it without spoiling uh, where we're going. Well, yeah, there's like... uh... There was a divide, wasn't there, where certain nineteen fifties, I don't know, let's just say for argument's sake, up to the, the middle point where mm. you had like hangovers from the thirties and forties where everybody's sort of high trousers, fast talking. That's very true, yeah, and suddenly Brando comes along in the mid fifties and yes, screen acting does change a lot. So this one is very much pre Brando. Yeah. Uh, it has that style to it, but as much as I mock it for not being one of those oh god, look at the space invaders, they are communists. Yeah. That, I pr- kind of like that campiness. Yeah, yeah. Those movies that basically, I mean, it ends on a moral that says the only people who can solve this conundrum is you. And yes. That's the thing which is kind of unique to 1950s cinema, which he always feels really awkward. <laughs> like, like Lem is the other example, uh, the giant ant movie, in which the, one of the scientist characters literally turns to the camera and does that exact same thing and points at the camera, you know. But how would mm. how would you revive this tradition for a modern blockbuster audience? Because I feel that if Iron Man ended a film by turning around and saying the only person who can stop this supervillain is you, it would kind of clash with the meaning of the rest of the movie. It w- it would. It kind of gives the whole thing. Um, a, how would I put this? A public information video sort of bent to it. Like. Yes. In the inspiration to it, it doesn't jive with modern standards, really, I guess. I mean, you can appreciate it for a fine piece of science fiction, which is influential mm. on literally everything. It's one of those movies where you can watch it without ever having watched it. It's like, oh, I remember that bit from something else or this bit from another movie. Yeah, I mean, I still think it fundamentally works. It just comes down to a a massive personal taste with the acting style for me. I think everything that isn't down to that particular style of line delivery is really solid. Okay, is any um, anything else that stood out for you, Andrew, on on this one? I just like what how much of a smug asshole Klaatu is. Oh, oh, you're one of Earth's smartest scientists. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just fix your equation for you here. <laughs> he does that with doctors as well, doesn't he? Uh, one of the doctors says he made me feel like a bumpkin from the sticks because they'll oh. have like life expectancy of 120 or something. Actually, that does remind me my absolute favorite thing in this film, and I don't know if it was like a deliberate thing by Robert Wise, but it's the mm. fact that the doctors discuss. God, how can how can he live to one hundred and twenty? He must be some marvel of medical science. Whilst lighting lighting up their cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is great. 
Uh, the 50s, they're still, would they still think they were healthy then? Yeah, there's still absolutely insane commercials from back in the 50s saying, you know, this cigarette can make you slimmer and sexier and healthier. And you know, obviously all the tobacco companies knew that they were killers, but they were keeping a pretty tight lid on it. Oh, yeah. Isn't there one where it's like, Camel's the only brand your doctor recommends? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and just off camera is a cigarette executive holding a gun to his head. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read about how that advert came about, where it was something like they went to a medical conference and just asked random people what brand they smoked. And yeah, a few more of them said camels than anything else, but it's not quite the same thing as having a medical recommendation. True. <laughs> True. Um, any other things we want to talk about before we wrap this one up? Or, or should I should have say, before I ask if people have seen the more modern iteration of this. So, anything about 1951 version? Well, I, I can answer that question you're going to ask very quickly. But, yeah, probably got... It is one of those things, isn't it, where early science fiction cinema had this idea of technological utopia that now looks very, very dystopian. I mean, Clark's civilization basically works because they're got type robots will just neutralize any attempt of violence immediately and they make sure that this happens by ensuring that the robots cannot be stood down and i'm sort of watching it thinking even if they are programmed with the absolute best intentions i'm not sure we're police robots that can't be turned off is the utopia that this movie wants me to think it is. Yeah, it's just, the, the whole twist is, you've discovered rockets and nuclear power. Behave, behave, yes. or we'll kill you all. <laughs> you know, sort like, yourself whoa. out, humanity. It's it's a bit <laughs> full on. I mean, <laughs> steady on, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just like that that is like Clark's big message at the end is like not a humanity by working together you can accomplish anything it's mess with us and this giant robot is going to absolutely mess you up okay <laughs> just stay in your damn lane humanity for the, for the stance it's taken to be sort of world peace is a good thing we should go for it that, that being the alternative really weird message to pin the whole movie on but yeah oh also the oh. other thing I really like is that, like, apparently for years and years, there was these all, like, fan theories about how to translate what Klaatu Barada Nikto means. All right. And it's just, it's a thing that they thought sounded cool. Yeah, that would have been my first guess. <laughs> Question, is that what the bit in Evil Dead Army of Darkness is in reference to, when he just gets it all wrong? Bruce yes, Campbell. yes. Oh, that's fun. I like that. Okay, so I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but the 2008 version, which recasts Klaatu as Keanu Reeves, has any, anybody seen that one? No. I have read the Wikipedia summary of it, and that was enough for me. <laughs> and what is your opinion of the Wikipedia summary of it? <laughs> it sounds bad in exactly the ways I assumed it would be bad. Like, <laughs> just this need to know we need to, like, ground everything and provide scientific explanations to the point where, no, the robot isn't just called GORT. It stands for, like, genetically organised robotic technology. Oh, wow. So aliens spell things the same way as us. That's that's nice. Oh, dear. Also, it <laughs> looks like a human because he came to Earth in, like, the 1920s and stole someone's DNA, and... Just, why? <laughs> well, there is that... Have you seen that... I don't know if it was a meme or whatever, which basically states that Keanu Reeves hasn't aged because there's somebody from hundreds of years ago who was essentially exactly the same as Keanu Reeves. Yes. <laughs> so it all, it all stacks up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay.
Dr. Hill. Hey, Dr. Bassett. Well, where's the patient? I hated to drag you out of bed at this time of night. Right. Will you let me go while there's still time? You'll soon see why I did. Doctor, will you tell these fools I'm not crazy? Make them listen to me before it's too late! I'll listen to you. Let him go. Who are you? I'm Dr. Hill from the State Mental Hospital. I'm not insane! Let him go! Listen. Doctor! Now, you must listen to me. You must understand me. I'm a doctor, too. I am not insane. Right, I am right, not insane. Right, now, I... now, suppose we just sit down over here, Dr. Bennell, and you tell me what happened. Well, it started. For me, it started last Thursday. In response to an urgent message from my nurse, I'd hurried home from a medical convention I'd been attending. At first glance, everything looked the same. It wasn't. Something evil had taken possession of the town. Taking a break from Andrew, myself and Graham chatting about Robert Wise. Um, to say what's coming up in the podcast, but if you are enjoying this edition of Directors Uncut, um, thank you. Please do consider giving us a rating wherever you get your podcast from, whether that's a whether that's a rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, or just a star rating on Spotify, both help. However, if you want to find out more about the podcast and what's happening coming up, and please do follow me on social media. On Twitter, I am at underscore RJ Simpson. And on Instagram, or IG, I am Directors Uncut Pod. But if you want to send something that's a little bit more detailed, please do email me at directorsuncutpod at gmail.com. Where I'd be happy to have that feature on this part of the show. I like to make this part of the show a bit more of a, a discussion with the people who are listening. Um. So, yeah. Let's let's segue into what is coming up in the next couple of episodes. Um, We have next week, it's uh, Don Siegel, who is is probably best known for his work with Clint Eastwood. And he also did the original inversion from the Body Snatchers in the 1950s. And after that um, is Nicholas Meyer, who's not a name which is immediately familiar. I mean, the fact that we do a TV movie is, is one of the big cues. But we did a TV, we do a TV movie because he's most famous for his work with a certain Star Trek movie, um, where a certain mad actor says Khan. So yeah, not doing Star Trek movies, not doing Star Wars movies, that kind of cuts that sort of thing out. So yes, those are the next two episodes coming up after this one. Don Siegel and Nicholas Meyer. After that, it'll be, um, a fresh new recording. So no spoilers for that yet, but look forward to those episodes coming up. Now let's jump back into uh, the recording with more on Robert Wise with myself, Graham and Andrew. You're crazy. (laughs) All right, so I'm crazy. You're counting your fingers and toes. I'm talking about five o o o o. I'll take that drink. Why aren't you so big you can call me up to this dump and shoot off your mouth? I got an idea. That's why, Slater. How would you like to pick up fifty thousand dollars all in small bills, just for yourself? Get wise to yourself, Ingram. You're just another black spot on Main Street. Shut that ugly mouth of yours, Earl. Get in the car. Someday I'm going to snap off your poisoned head. Listen to me, Johnny. Back up, Burke. The odds will never be right. I know how to handle him. I've been handling him all my life. He's no different because he got him a $20 pair of shoes. All right, Slater. Handle me. The next time you call me, I'm going to see you. I'll be waiting. You're not just another white spot to me. At night, I tell you, people, when that cold, cold sun goes down, 
cry, I sigh, I want to die Cause my baby's not around um, but this one stars Henry Belafonte, uh, Robert Ryan, and, oh, forget who plays the sort of instigator behind it all. His name's on the tip of my tongue. Ed Begley, Shelley yes. Winters. Yes, Ed Begley is who I was thinking of. What a great face Ed Begley has, by the way. Uh, well, I don't tend to review people's faces, but sure, why, why not? Let's do it. <laughs> Just great, craggy, kind of old character actor face. I'm very fond of it. Sort of, uh, yeah, he's an actor much in the line of um, Harry Dean Stanton. Mm. Yes, definitely. This one takes place in an unnamed American city. Henry Henry Belafonte is a jazz club singer, being Mm. like the smoothest human being on the planet. He's so cool, isn't he? (laughs) Yes. Uh, Robert Ryan is, let's be frank, he is a shit. (laughs) <laughs> there's, his, there's no way for it. his dialogue is full of racial slurs so appalling that if you said them now you'd be elected prime minister of the united kingdom <laughs> oh, hey full circle um and ed begley is a uh he's a well he's been fired as a policeman he was one day away from retirement and then uh my old stereotype and then he had to basically go out and make a case for his own. And I'll just say this here. He doesn't deserve that dog. He just doesn't. He's a bad dog owner. And he's got a plan. Ed Begley has. Uh, there's a, I guess it's a bank's sort of sourcing office after hours in which it has minimal security. Um, and he needs some people to do it. He effectively sells it as you just walk in and walk out. 50 grand each. Easy. And there's bits in the background, like uh, like I mentioned, Robert Ryan is a shit, and he needs to feel less like a shit. So to feel less like a shit, he becomes more of a shit. I've made a circle there of something. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And uh, Belafonte owns a lot of money to a, a bad gang man. Um, so all the cards are set, and there we are. It's basically a desperate men need one last hit to, you know, come steady and live a normal life. Yeah. And I don't want to spoil anything, um, you know, unless we do want to go into spoilers, but I'm not going to do it now. Um, so I will say there is a part of me that judges film noir largely on how miserable the ending is. And Christ, this is a miserable <laughs> ending. So I enjoyed that very much. Yeah, I mean, it has like the three main staples of film noir, which are hmm. big depressing ending, fedoras, People staring across a dilapidated waterfront while jazz music plays in the background. <laughs> yes. oh, but seriously, Harry Belafonte. I mean, my my word has ever been a cooler person in movies. I don't think that. I think you'd be lying, honestly. He is incredible. Even the scene where he freaks out and ruins another singer's song, he manages to do it in a way that's really slick and efficient. So, if anybody else has men breadwinning uh, job was playing a xylophone in a nightclub jazz band. I think he's being silly. What is xylophone being in a jazz band? Don't be daft. But no. <laughs> I mean, are we sure that his money troubles are caused by his gambling debts and not the fact that, say, he's a professional glockenspiel player? <laughs> well, call him A and call him B. Hmm. <laughs> if he just needs a cooler backstory, then... I only get paid like 5p an hour because I hit this metal bar with a stick. Yes! <laughs> he does make it look cool, though. He really does, yeah. Um, but that's one of the uh, things that makes it stand out from uh, Noir, really, the fact that he, he is one of the most influential uh, black actors, mm. just in general. And there's a few, I think Pool of London, had, I can't remember his name, Earl James, was it? McCarthy. He was like a, another black actor in a film noir of the era, which tackled sort of um, the problem of being a black man in a white man's country, as it's, it's worded in this. Yeah. But it's a very, very uncommon thing that happens in these movies. It's just about miserable white blokes or miserable Italian blokes you know, dragging everybody into the horrible situation in their life. But this no, is sort true. of a awareness beyond... I mean, that speech he shares with his, his wife and... It wakes up his daughter. I think that stands it again, apart from the start of movie, typically. 
and I suppose it's why I'd always <laughs> um, I'd heard of this movie before, uh, but I'd always sort of quietly filed it away in my head as one of those like late fifties, early sixties civil rights message movies, like the Defiant Ones or Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. I didn't realise that it was a noir, and it was such a full on pessimistic noir at that because it all as you say it is so unusual for the noir genre to have a black leading man uh, certainly you know until you get into uh, i would say you're well into the 90s before you start to see neo noirs regularly made with black leads it was a uh, earl cameron in pool of london but yeah it's not a long list in this era no which you know is interesting as a it, it doesn't sabotage the movie in that not sabotage it's the wrong word it doesn't wear down the movie in one scene, as in many classic movies of this era, in my opinion. Hmm. All of their classic status seems to be pinned on one scene, especially like lesser noir, I found. Yeah. But, um, yeah, this isn't really the case here. This stands up as a... I was shocked to find out it was post-noir, sort of 1959, rather than sort of in the 40s, because it doesn't sort of... Uh, it's not shot as a 1950s movie. It's shot using period-specific... Styles, it is a 40s noir, yeah, absolutely, absolutely in every sense. In fact, it's even shot in a 4 3 aspect ratio to preserve the integrity of Robert Wise's creative direction. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we get people from Behold on, it just introduces us to a, a much more broad appeal kind of, um, <laughs> kind of in joke. That's great. It's like it's a yeah. film stop joke that the whole world gets to laugh at. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'll be honest. Even as a film fan, I've never paid attention to aspect ratio, so it just you know never really clicked. I don't really pay attention. I think um, it was very easy to ignore them in the past, but I think the the experience of setting up a DVD player for the first time kind of made everyone into an aspect ratio bore for a bit, if only to answer the eternal question of why do the people in the film look like they're being squashed? Yeah, or when they're just chopped off the sides and mm. where's the rest of the movie gone? What was that, panned and scanned, that was the term for that? That's the fella, yeah. What a revelation it was watching things on DVD for the first time after you'd seen them on VHS. Yeah. I've got to say, though, we have to, we have to talk around that ending. It's You can't... Do we want to spoil it, or do we not? Or do we want to look at this? Because you can't say it's got a great bleak ending and leave it at that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the film did come out in 1959. I think people have had a fair <laughs> chance to watch it if they want to. It's very true, yes. It's also it's yeah, literally I mean... on YouTube if you want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a horribly bleak ending because, you know, it's a noir. Everything obviously goes wrong. But it's the extent to which it goes wrong, which is much more interesting, I think. Yeah, I think so. I I would compare it to the ending of Criss Cross in the, oh, everyone in this film is completely doomed, Stakes. Yeah, what was that other one? Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. Kiss Me Deadly, was it? Oh, Kiss Me Deadly. Yeah, that's the, that's, yeah, that's the ultimate bleak noir ending, isn't it? End of film, end of California. Yeah, and apparently there is another version where they've cut a bit off, which makes it even more bleak. Yes, yeah, because you know they're only going to melt, really. Yeah. Um. So I think we kind of got to come up and say what this is. So Yeah. Uh, things go horribly wrong. Mm. Uh, what starts I set it off? Um, nothing, really. It's just the policeman st- stops at a traffic light, and that's basically it, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah. I like it because it's basically one of those things where the whole heist goes wrong because the notoriously unlucky gambler that Ed Begley hired has some bad luck causing <laughs> the notorious hothead that Ed Begley hired to react incredibly rashly and start a gunfight. Who could yeah, possibly re- have foreseen this? <laughs> in retrospect, not a great plan. 
Uh, but yeah, um, it, yeah, it still sells it. And I think part of why it sells it is because the heist itself is so tense. I mean, this came out after Rafifi, and I wondered if Robert Wise had seen that because the, the heist isn't as quiet as Rafifi because no film since The Jazz Singer has been as quiet as Rafifi. But it does have that kind of pin drop quality. It is very quiet, very cold, very careful. Hmm. And then it isn't, you know, yes. and everything goes wrong. Uh, essentially, they've been at each other's necks, these two men. Uh, Robert Ryan, because he doesn't, because he's a racist and he's horrible, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and uh, Belafonte just stands up for himself. And that tension, it, it builds up and it builds up. I mean, mm. given the way things unfold, there's only really one way that the movie can, can end with them. Yeah, blows, that's true. really, isn't it? Yeah, but I think it's... There are some movies about racism from this era that have dated. There are some that have dated, but you can still see they've got a good heart. And I'm not sure this has really dated that much in anything other than a stylistic sense. I mean, sometimes when you watch older movies, you're shocked at how free and easy they are with the racial slurs. And there is a tendency to kind of think about this in terms of oh right they didn't know it was the standards of the time but every time Robert Ryan utters a slur I think Wise absolutely expects that to shock the audience you can tell by the the way they're deployed and the infrequency with which they're deployed yes and also it's a fantastic performance from Robert Ryan Mm. no I agree Um, in terms of behind the scenes stuff we talked a bit about the sort of leftist messaging in The Day of the Earth Stood Still, but this is a real case of it because it was written by screenwriter Abraham Polonsky, who at that time was on the Hollywood blacklist. So his script had to be credited to Nelson Gidding, a writer who was operating as a front, who essentially lent his credit to blacklisted writers so they could work and get paid. That's a good story, you know. Mm-hmm. I can see that uh, Dalton Trumbo movie uh, a few years back then. Uh, yes, yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, this might have been a more interesting story to tell, honestly, for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk about the final shot, but it's one of these... Uh, oh, well, it's horrible, really, isn't it? It makes you think about the level of violence that's taken place in a way that is really kind of unusual for this era of Hollywood. Uh, yeah, because... Essentially, it is a kiss me deadly sort of ending mm. where it's just horrible and no one stands a chance, really. It's just yeah. one line where uh, a fireman says, Which one is which? Yes. It has all sorts of like ramifications, sort of politically, as well as sort of like, a story. Like, politically, um, maybe suggesting that the violence basically, well, I don't know, really. It's kind of dense and a lot to unpack, really, on a piffy podcast. <laughs> Yeah, and there, there is something so horrible about teaching them that lesson in that way. Yeah. But, Andrew, what did you think of it in all? Yeah, I really dug this a lot. Like, especially just sort of the through line of sort of comparing and contrasting these two men, like, looking at how they're obviously both very different, but they're still, like, in their own way. They're basically two guys who just don't fit in with modern society. Like mm. Harry Belafonte, obviously because he is a black man living in a white man's world, and Robert Ryan because he's basically just like this old dinosaur of a man. Yeah, that scene with the the kids in the bar, especially yeah. with the uh, military guy. Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing for me is I I did like the ending, but it felt a little bit. I mean, basically, like you were saying with Day the Earth Stood Still, is it was practically you know turned to camera. I guess they weren't so different after all. I guess, yeah, although, as I say, the sheer sadism with which this message is put home is is really, it diffuses the kind of wholesomeness of the model for me in an interesting way. Yeah, I'd admit that it is less saccharine, you know, let's all hold hands and be friends when we're standing above the like, charred bodies of men who exploded themselves to death rather than, like, work together. Yes. It is kind of a shock that that happens as well. You you do not see it coming whatsoever. Mm. 
No, yeah. definitely. Uh, Graham, any sort of closing thoughts on odds against tomorrow? Well, my, my only closing thought is that, like the day the Earth still, this has a very good score. And I noticed it was uh, a score by John Lewis, who I assume was taking time off from <laughs> running a successful chain of department stores to uh, to record the score to a classic film noir. Good for him. Well, we all need a side hustle, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Um, so it kind of brings us full circle then to the director. I, yeah. I, you know, you, you can't really... It's kind of an exception to the rule, really, what we think, because he's made so many different movies, but I'm still sort of compelled to ask that question. What did we think of Robert Wise through these two pieces of work? Hmm. I thought he was good at picking musical directors. <laughs> yes, he's very good. <laughs> I mean, I think that there is constant moral sense that runs through Wise's work. I don't think there are, you know, there are plenty of people who would make a science fiction movie into a message movie, and there are plenty of people who would make a film noir into a message movie, and there are even some people who would make a musical where Christopher Plummer is basically Antifa. Uh, But I think the fact that he remains so consistent in his moral sense across all these genres is the ghost in the machine for someone who, you know, did not see himself as an author in the same way that the French uh, directors of the time would have seen themselves as authors. I think it is very easy to look at these films and work out what kind of values Robert Wise would have held dear. Um. I can't really follow that the sort of line of inquiry up, but what I appreciated about him is his sort of uh, contrariness to the standards of the time. Like um, mm. a yeah. post noir noir would wouldn't have is typically not this ferocious, really, in its standards or its sadism, as Graham pointed out. And the same with uh, the day the F stood still. That is made in an era in which people were making communist allegories, which were Wather or Finn, so to speak. <laughs> and he basically didn't really count out at the conventions at the time, which I think is, is really interesting when it wasn't really a time for people to sort of go against the curve. We we're talking about a time when sort of society in America anyway was othering people who had different political beliefs. So to make these movies where he was openly flirting with that sort of thing, it's... Mm. Interesting, an interesting path as a director. I mean, I don't know whether you could find anything like that in The Haunting, you know, where his movies you've seen, but it's interesting as him as a creator in that very, very tense and fraught era to make these choices for me. I mean, even the even the Haunting, which I do agree is is less of a message based film, does have a pretty obviously queer coded character, which was not a normal thing for early sixties Hollywood. No, I assume they thought people who... No, no, it was a, still a crime then, wasn't it? In many parts of the world. It was still a crime to identify as, as anything other than straight and mean at that time of the history. Yeah. He also does the scene a lot where a man gets shot and they throw their arms and go, and fall down. <laughs> he does That's, take he a does. pounding, doesn't he? He does take a pounding, does begly. What in God's name is going on here? <laughs> Devil is amongst us. Stay back, boy. This calls for divine intervention. <laughs> I kick ass for the Lord. Before I segue into the final bit where we talk about the movies that we've been watching, typically for a Patreon migrated episode, we'd record something fresh, something new. Um, that's technically true, but in this case, it's a cutting from, it's a freebie, I should say, um, from the last ever Patreon edition of Directors Uncut. So, 
Without further ado, let's jump into that again with Graham crossing the streams. And Aiden. Okay, so to the end of the show, um, what else have we been watching? Ladies and gentlemen, well, gentlemen, uh, <laughs> present company, I have seen The North Man and it absolutely rocks. Wonderful. I am not a fan of big historical battle type movies. I don't, I kind of like Spartacus. It's not top tier Kubrick, but don't like Gladiator. Don't like all those Cecil B. DeMille films. You know, Mm. the whole thing is just not my deal. This is absolutely wild. It delivers exactly what I want from this kind of movie, which is a movie that makes you really get the sense of how different and alien these times were to our times and that's not a surprise coming from someone like Robert Eggers because you can say he's he's done it with the witch he's done it with the lighthouse they have a sense of the the archaic and the strange and things that have been forgotten uh, but he's never managed to do it as a big budget action movie and i think i, I was quite shocked when i saw a bus go past for the first time with a poster for the North Man on the side because I knew this film was coming out because I love Eggers' previous work and I've been following mm. it. But I didn't realise it was going to be... I, you know, I thought it was going to be something maybe a little bit bigger than The Lighthouse was or The Witch was. I wasn't expecting it to be full-scale blockbuster. I wasn't expecting it to have massive, gory battle scenes. You know, I, I wasn't expecting it to have huge recreated Viking villages that get burned down. I wasn't expecting any of this. And it works on that level. And I think people who go in expecting it to be a big action blockbuster, because that's what they've seen it advertised as, will also be quite surprised when Ethan Hawke and Willem Dafoe get down on all fours and start barking like dogs because they've drank hallucinogenic drinks and they're seeing all of their ancestors connected by umbilical cords to a big floating tree. I think that might surprise people a bit as well. Sold. (laughs) (laughs) It is bananas. I mean, it is is a film that just when you think it can't possibly get any weirder, suddenly there's a blind sorceress in an elaborate headdress played by Björk, and you think, all right, uh, evidently I'm unimaginative. It can go crazier. And Björk's done some really crazy things as well. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's... She's not someone you get when you want to put the narrative back on comfortingly familiar tracks. Mm. (laughs) He's uh, really emerged, hasn't he, Robert Eggers? He came out of nowhere, and there's not many directors who have like three movies straight and they're all effectively killers. Absolutely not. And yeah. Like a Jordan Peele vibe, don't you? I mean, they're literally the only two that I can think of in, in in the current era. I admire that they're all very different films, but they all feel very Robert Eggersy. You know what I mean? I think The Witch is very different from The Lighthouse, but it's still very Robert Eggersy. And I think The Northman is massively different from The Witch and The Lighthouse, but at the same time, still pretty Robert Eggersy, I would say. I mean, what his movies are, they're kind of down to earth and tactile and grubby. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So he's good That's for Viking me. material. He doesn't scrub it up. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he would have made a great uh, Nosferatu. Was he going to do? Or was it Frankenstein? No, it he was Nosferatu. Yeah. Nosferatu. Yeah, and I think he's still holding out some hope for that. I mean, that was a little t- uh, mistake on my behalf, but I would totally be down for an Eggers uh, Frankenstein movie. Now you've mentioned it, yeah, I could go for that as well. Mm. It's been a while since you've had a, a good one, not a whatever that. Was it Victor Frankenstein? Oh, am I imagining things oh, again? Yeah, no, there was that. Oh, yeah, there was, with yeah, there was I Frankenstein, uh, which firstly it's about the monster, so no, you're not Frankenstein. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not good films. Yeah, uh, Aiden, do you have anything that you want to bring up? Oh god, well, following on from, uh, we're trying to follow up Graham like high art. I'm gonna go with <laughs> something a bit different because. Um, because I, I was down in London on a, a business trip. It was just for a networking event, and I had a free day spare, and I was just like, oh, let's go to the cinema. Okay, so what do I go see? Do I go see The Northman? Do I go see Benedetta? No, I don't. Uh, I instead waste money to go see Sonic the Hedgehog 2. You had the BFI <laughs> South Bank right there. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> 
<laughs> to be fair on it, and to be fair, it's actually better than the first one, and I think it's all right. So, there. It's, so what it, you basically said is, ah, yeah, it's better than having your balls kicked. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I would still rather see that than Morbius, let's be fair. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, because what were our feelings on the first one? Because I remember, like, Graham really didn't like it, and I was a bit mm, on it as well. I honestly can't remember. It's just it's a movie I've seen. That's all I can tell you. Mm. Yeah, I remember finding it pretty I'd, annoying. Yeah, and I thought it was all right because largely because it it builds up from what uh, the first one wasn't that great at all. I mean, because here's like take a video game character and then stick him in uh, basically like this road trip adventure that just really didn't sell it all that well, to be honest. And this one, at least, it tries to. It, it seems like they're like. Jeff Fowler have gotten like feedback from the original, the first one, and do like a, give it a bit more depth to it. I think not only for um, Ben Schwartz's better cast, but Idris Elba I think is having a whale of a time in this. Um, <sighs> but no, I th- anything with Idris <laughs> Elba in is better. But apart from that, you know, there's some decent things. There's not some great things about it. I mean, th- I think Jim Carrey's still annoying in it, and, you know, the human characters. It's Jim Carrey. Come on, Aiden. Of course he's annoying <laughs> in it. I-, I can understand him being <laughs> annoying in it, because, uh, as he said recently, movie stars aren't the cool kids anymore. So, yeah, I'm. Uh, uh, this is like post-fall Jim Carrey. He's a disillusioned and broken man. If he ever thought he was cool, no, Jim. (laughs) No. (laughs) Behave. (laughs) Much like the people who are sort of claiming this to be like the second coming of Christ, like the best movie ever. It's like, come on. Like I say, I think it's all right. I think it has its problems, but, you know, I'm an idiot for this stuff. (laughs) That's Um, fine. Uh, and the other one that I would love to talk about on this that honestly it, it really did knock me away is, of course, Brain Dead uh, oh. as part of. Hadn't seen it before. And so I'm going to say this before you go further. I have the theory that Peter Jackson died making this movie and they just found a random <laughs> guy in uh, New Zealand that looked sort of like him. It's a black hair and goatee and wear a wine <laughs> shirt and shorts. He'll do. He's the new Peter Jackson. <laughs> yeah, it, because it, it, there's it, such a of, big there's such a big divide between this and what happened afterwards. <laughs> he's had such a wild career. I mean, I am certain it's not the same fella because there's Brain Dead. Okay, that's great, and then a few years after that, Lord of the Rings, and it's just like, well, okay, I was not expecting that. And then a, a few years after that, he's now making documentaries on like musicians. Yeah, it's like I say, the original Peter Jackson died. This is a new guy, completely new it's- guy. It was strange enough looking back at things like Brain Dead and Bad Taste and going, wait, that's the guy who does Lord of the Rings. But looking back on them now and thinking, wait, that's the guy who made They Shall Not Grow Old is even weirder. Yes. <laughs> it's such a wild thing to behold. And I just love it, Brain Dead. I, I honestly think it's his best film because it is just. Oh, wow. The amount of practical effects, the amount of joy that it's having is just so endearing to have. On that practical effects, I don't know if it's true now, but once upon a time, it was, quote, the bloodiest film ever made. I think you'd yeah, still have to, I mean, you'd struggle to beat it. Yeah, you would. You'd have to really go for it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, it's just like the amount of gore, the amount of, I, I think it's like reported, it was like, what, 300 litres of blood that was used in the final lawnmower sequence in general? It was yeah, like a, some, some, cra- some crazy number like that. But I mean, you, haven't it, even, you haven't even mentioned the great thing about he kicks ass for the Lord. I mean, come on. <laughs> come how, on I know. How amazing <laughs> is that? Because I immediately fought Father Ted when I <laughs> saw that. It does have that vibe, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, giant mutant, the giant mutant baby that gets just like, gets somehow indestructible <laughs> yes it's it is like the epitome of slapstick no splatstick sorry mm. i've completely taken the wind out of you there but <laughs> splatstick is like it's like a it's basically gore gore is comedy yeah that's yeah. what this movie is it's like the the high watermark for that i think yeah it's like you saw and, you know, bed too yeah. and thought it's good but i can top it yeah <laughs> honestly just loved it from top to bottom it's a wonderful film okay um, I, I have to bring it down a little bit, but come on, you can't go up. Like we said, they can't go up from brain dead. You'd, yeah, I think 
you, you just basically have to take cocaine and start, you know, rolling around in your own bodily juices to do that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, no, an order, 10,000 Nights in the Jungle. Mm. Uh, this was very highly acclaimed at last year's can. Um, this is about a Second World War st- soldier who was charged with looking after this island in the Pacific and basically making it a place for uh, a second attack, a second thing to happen with World War Two, like a, a war after the war. And he does that. He, he gets that charge in 1944, months, essentially, before the end of World War Two. But he doesn't leave. He stays there until, I think, 1978. Continuing a guerrilla war with a group of f- uh, another three people at first, but they sort of fall away for various reasons. But yeah, it's it's fascinating, and it's all the true story. This thing genuinely yes. happened. Mm. He died in I think twenty thirteen, but it's a fascinating story, and it's it's done I think the right way, and it's got no particularly huge stars from Japanese cinema in there. It's quite pedestrian and mundane, but. It has to be because you are summing up somebody's twenty-seven years of somebody's life and what happened in those years and the guerrilla warfare he did, and effectively losing his mind and the mental gymnastics he does. Because there's one sequence where people from Japan turn up and say, "You know what? The war's ended. Here's some stuff." And the backflips he does to justify that they're lying are incredible. And it's not like uh, making it up to fill in blanks that history haven't. Uh, offered up really the uh, script was co-written by a guy who did the book and interviewed the actual guy so this is about as authentic a st- like a take on this guy's story as you're going to get right it's genuinely genuinely fascinating hmm. wonderful I know it's come down from the other movies but as far as sort of a historical movie about war I don't like war movies war movies are boring shoot some guns <laughs> uh, I'd put a fellow of them dead that's boring four hours of that I don't care but yeah. this is like a <laughs> A real story about a real person in a story, which is the truth is way more fantastical than like lies or fantasy in this case, I think. Yeah, and that's a third window release, isn't it? Yeah, they'll be putting out in May, I think, May 16th, that comes out. I'm excited for that then, I'd like to see that. Yeah, it's two hours, 40 minutes, which I think is a great way of getting rid of the people who aren't really interested. I think, oh, <laughs> yeah. it's just a war movie. I also feel like if he can stay out in the jungle for 30 years, I can probably like carve out three hours of my day to watch his story. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I'd rather watch three hours of this than three hours of the Batman. I haven't seen it yet. Still, I'd rather. <laughs> yes. No, I completely agree with you. I was uh, not that fond of the Batman either. Uh, I disagree. I enjoyed it. So mm. There's been too many Batman movies. Can he just piss off and do something else for a while? You know, too many. It's like nine in about as many years. That's what it feels like. I don't know. I think they should all have a fight to decide which one is the proper Batman. Yeah. Batman v. Batman. V. Batman v. Batman v. Batman. 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 (laughs) (laughs) That'd be fun, actually. I'd watch that. (laughs) So do we have anything left over that we'd like to to bring up or mention? It does have to be movies. Yeah, um, it is going to be movies, because I'm sure as hell not watching TV. Uh, except Taskmaster, obviously, which uh, I'm really glad to see you're on that, convert to now. Yeah. I'm on, I was a convert anyway, I'm on series 10, and there's an episode where they have to feed each other melon without touching each other. And oh, I think he had a breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's genuinely <laughs> slightly disturbing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> is it I, I was like... broken, utterly broken, completely... <laughs> You know, ugly, crying laughter. It was horrible, but hilarious. <laughs> is, this the, is this the same taskmaster that's uh, presented by Greg Davies? Or? That's the yes. one, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, there's, in fact, uh, since I, I will be on one of these uh, what have you been watching things soon, I might just stash what I was going to talk about and just talk about Taskmaster for another minute or so, uh, because the, the new series is on Channel 4. Not spoiling anything for Rob, because I know you're going to work your way up to this. But, uh, you can't spoil it, I, I mean, come on. Yeah. I am very, very excited by what a little shit stirrer Adlo Handlin is. Any time there's something wrong <laughs> with someone else's task, he's always the guy to go, ah, I don't know, the rules did say, and it's not in a sort of picky or pedantic way. You can tell that he's absolutely loving causing trouble. It's great. 
it's just a fun show. Has it, has it tra- uh, translated internationally, or is it still very... There's some countries that have got their own version. I watched a season of the New Zealand one, which is really great, really worth digging out. And it introduced mm. me to Guy Montgomery, a New Zealand comedian who I'd never heard before, but now I love him. Not just for his performance on Taskmaster New Zealand, but because he has a podcast where every year on American Independence Day, him and his friends will review the movie Paul Blatt Mall Cop 2 until one of them <laughs> dies in a feature they have titled Till Death Us Do Blatt. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, wow. And also, Rose Matafeo was great in her series. Yes. Yeah, she's brilliant. Season 8, that, I think. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. It's all been a wonderful blur of watching this. Yeah. <laughs> I think except season 7, when I saw Rod Gilbert was on it. I don't know if this translates to anybody who doesn't know British comedy, but my heart sank because I goddamn hate that miserable shit. See, I think the beauty of Taskmaster is that it's kind of comedian-proof. There have been people on it where I thought, I I do not like your comedy, but they've generally done pretty well. I mean, I'm not a fan of Noel Fielding, but I had no problem with season four of Taskmaster because it's just like, if someone is genuinely witty, that's great, they'll do well on it. Mm. If they're not genuinely witty, it doesn't matter. They have to paint a horse while riding on a horse. (laughs) <laughs> I mean Tim Key Tim Key is an awful comedian the worst of the worst but he managed it really well I think he's another one who's such a sneak isn't he I thought he was great on it yeah if you've not seen it it's all on all four pretty much I think yeah do one just splurge and enjoy yourself yeah 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 um, anything else are we we are good all done just that Taskmaster splurge at the end yeah that's wonderful <laughs> That's End it there. Troop cinema. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, some of the movies they've made on that, I'll never ever ever forget, including Sally Phillips' Mortimer's... "Water Cooler Moments." That'll. Yeah, Bob Mortimer's stop motion banana animation. <laughs> like yes. Spank Meyer at his best. True cinema. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh so, my um... god! Imagine a version of Taskmaster, but with all famous filmmakers. I That's how they should decide the Oscars. Yeah, Herzog would win everything, of course, because he's indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Aiden where can we find you online uh, you can find me on Letterboxd under the username Aiden F uh, I'm on Twitter at Doco and Drummer uh, that's pretty much me yep. and Graham you can find me on Letterboxd as Graham Williamson Twitter at Graham W Film uh, which is also how I'm on Instagram uh, I also write for The Geek Show and Horrified.com Excellent, and I have been your host, Rob Simpson, and that was Directors Uncut. Uncut. <laughs>